Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Would you go to Daniel chapter 6? We're going to go to the Old Testament. The Old Testament today. Daniel chapter 6. You can use the front of your Bible if you need to just to find where it's at. Sometimes we don't visit some of these books so we can forget. Uh, we'll have the scripture on the screen as well. I'm talking today about what I'm calling this, the title of this sermon is Bridges in Babylon. Bridges in Babylon. The setting of this message is Daniel and some friends and others in the, in the family of God, the Israelites, were taken captive by a king by the name of King Nebuchadnezzar, and they were brought back to Babylon in, in Daniel chapter 1. And the purpose of them being brought back in, uh, well, King Nebuchadnezzar, what he did is he found anyone that was smart and uh, people that he could change and conform to his ways and his culture. And so his purpose was to try to bring them in and use them for his own kingdom. So he would take the smartest, brightest people around in these countries and use them for his own kingdom. And pretty much what he would do is he would indoctrinate them and try to change their way of thinking and who they worship. Well, he actually dies and passes on. And in Daniel 6, we have a new king, and his name is Darius, and they're still in Babylon. And Babylon in the Bible always has this this godless pagan society to it, okay? It's always really against God's people. And so what I'm talking about today is we're living in a time today in our world where the world is against us as Christians. But I want to go ahead and just give a little disclaimer here. When I, when I preach in such a way of the strong statements I'm going to make today, I'm not really trying to do a us versus them sermon, Okay, what I what I believe God does is God's posture is he has love towards sinners. And and when he loves someone, he'll tell them the truth and he'll warn them of dangerous things. And so what, what, what I have to share today and what God's put on my heart is all postured towards love for our world and our nation in America. I just want you to know that. And so if you're new and you're watching and you don't know my style or at least just my convictions as a pastor. Um, I'm an anchor in Christ and his word, and I'm not going to move from it because his word is faithful and true, and it's unchanging. His promises are unchanging. He's unchanging. And the reason why God would, uh, by the way, you ready for this? The reason why Daniel is even in Babylon is because his own people, God's own people, were sinning and disobeying him. So God allowed Daniel and them to be taken captive because God was going to use him to be a bridge for his kingdom and his glory right there in a wicked city, in a pagan city. And church, we're like this. We're like Daniel today. Bridges in Babylon, bridges in America, bridges in our world. So let's read this story to get a better idea and just know that I preach this out of love for my friends who don't know God. And we as a church, I preach this to the church to say we must, be, we must stay faithful to God and his word as we live in Babylon. So Daniel chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces, and he appointed a high officer to rule over each province. The king also chose Daniel and two others as administrators to supervise the high officers and protect the king's interest. Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and high officers. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. Wow. Church, you know what we can do in our world right now? We can live with so much integrity and, and work so hard in our workplaces and be such good people in our neighborhoods that there's actually favor for us wherever we are. Like Christians should be the most hardest working, most in, most the best leaders in integrity, the best examples in integrity and honesty than any other people because we have God as our Lord and we have Daniels like our examples. And I want to encourage you, wherever you're working, wherever you're living, whoever it is that's around you, lead by a good example because God will elevate you in their eyes. And that's what was happening to Daniel. Then the other administrators, verse 4, 
and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs, but they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn him. So now you have some jealous, some other leaders who are jealous of Daniel because he keeps getting elevated and he's not even from Persia. He's an Israelite and they're not, they're not digging this. So now they're jealous and they're trying to find something to criticize or condemn him. It says he was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. So they concluded, in other words, they couldn't find anything wrong with this guy. So they concluded our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel would be in connection with the rules of his religion. Now, was Daniel perfect? No, no human being is perfect. But when it came to judicial rules and administration in Babylon, he wasn't messing up. He was sticking to the letter of the law. At the same time, he was worshiping God. Wow. So he was respectful to the king around him, but he still worshiped God above the king. So what do they do? They're like, we're going to have to find a rule with his religion. We're going to have to set up a trap. So the administrators, verse 6, and high officers went to the king and said, long live King Darius. We are all in agreement, we administrators, officials, high officers, advisors, and governors, that the king should make a law that will be strictly enforced. Give orders that, so that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions. Interesting. Daniel's reputation for being a man of prayer is that well known that they would go, let's trap him with prayer. So Daniel must be caught praying all the time, seen praying, living for God all the time. So this is what happens in verse 8. And now your majesty issue and sign this law so that it cannot be changed, an official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. So King Darius signed the law. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and stopped praying. Just make sure we're listening. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open toward Jerusalem, a custom that they would do, and he prayed three times a day just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. Then the officials went together to Daniel's house because they were trying to trap him and found him praying and asking for God's help. So they went straight to the king and reminded him about his law. Did you not sign a law that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions? Yes, the king replied, that decision stands. It is an official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. So here's the thing. King Nebuchadnezzar and, and Belteshazzar, in the first few chapters of Daniel, they had the power to change their own law. The Persian king that took over Babylon... In their culture, you can't change any law that you make. He's about to regret that. He's about to regret that. So, it goes on in verse 13. Then, he, then they told the king, that man Daniel, one of the captives from Judah, is ignoring you and your law. He still prays to his God three times a day. Hearing this, the king was deeply troubled, and he tried to think of a way to save Daniel. He spent the rest of the day looking for a way to get Daniel out of this predicament. In the evening, the men went together to the king and said, Your majesty, you know that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no law that the king signs can be changed. So at last, the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of lions. The king said to him, May your God, whom you serve so faithfully, rescue you. So the king is fully aware that Daniel serves God faithfully. Isn't that interesting? So Daniel was allowed to serve his God. It wasn't this king that was doing this. It was Daniel's haters who created a trap and a new law to stop Daniel. You know, what's, you know what that's interesting? Let me, let me tell you what's interesting. I noticed this yesterday as I was reviewing. These, these conspirators against Daniel, they didn't really care about the king. They cared about their own elevation and status. A little kid said, uh-oh, that was cute. They, they didn't care about the king and, and who was worshiping him. They made that up because they were jealous of Daniel. 
And I want to backtrack for a moment, too, and just tell you that God wants believers to be in power in different branches of the U.S. government. God put Daniel in this position to be a light and to influence that community. God wants us to do our work and our study and our voting to put believers of Jesus Christ in places where we can reach the world. And here's the thing. God appoints people to do things, and we may not even understand how it works, but King Darius was actually not against Daniel. God was using King Darius. But unfortunately, because of law, and because he didn't see the trap, he gave into it. He gave into it. So let's keep going. I think I've lost my place here. Let's find it. <laughs> verse 16, I think. Okay, no, verse 17. So he said, may, may your God, whom you serve, so faithfully rescue. And then it says, a stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den where the lions were. The king sealed the stone with his own royal seal and the seals of his nobles so that no one could rescue Daniel. That must have been hard for him. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night fasting. He refused his usual entertainment and couldn't sleep at all that night. Very early the next morning, the king got up and hurried out to the lion's den. When he got there, he called out in anguish, Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God whom you served so faithfully able to rescue from the lions? And Daniel answered, long live the king. Long live the king. My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth so they would not hurt me, for I have been found innocent in his sight, and I have not wronged you, your majesty. A man of integrity, faithful to God, and God rescues him and elevates him out of that pit of death, unharmed. Church, the same thing will happen to us in the end. Whether we die now or whether we're alive for Jesus' return, if you and I stay faithful, we will be raised up. We will be saved by our Lord if we remain faithful to the end. That is our promise from God. That's God's promise for us. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That's why the Bible says, don't fear man, fear God, who has the power to destroy body and soul. Don't fear man. Verse 23 says, the king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be lifted from the, from the den. Not a scratch was found on him, for he had trusted in his God. Then the king gave orders to arrest the men. This gets a little gruesome, a little real. By the way, if the Bible's boring, you need to read the Old Testament, because it's not. <laughs> then the king gave orders to arrest the men who had maliciously accused Daniel. He had them thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and children. What terrible decision, huh? Isn't that interesting, though? that our choices, parents, can lead our kids into destruction. Be careful what side you're on. Is it the truth and the side of God, or is it the side of this world? Because in the end, that's what's going to happen to those who don't follow Jesus. The lions leaped on them and tore them apart before they even hit the floor of the den. Then King Darius sent his message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world, Peace and prosperity to you. This is the king of a pagan nation. I decree that everyone throughout my kingdom should tremble with fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and he will endure forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed. How is it that a pagan king knows this? And his rule will never end. He rescues and saves his people. He performs miraculous signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. Wow. Praise God. Like it was for Daniel in Babylon <clears throat> church, we are meant to be on wavering bridges in an increasingly godless society that we're living in today. Again, remember my posture of love today. So if you're brand new and you're listening, I say all the things I'm about to say out of love for you in Delaware and the world. Same posture that God has. Actually, I, think it's, I actually think it's hate that we don't tell people the truth. 
It's not love, that's for sure. If we're going to serve and follow God, we need to expect tests and challenges to our faith in God. The foundations of our bridges are going to be tested by waves every day. In fact, every day, our young people, our kids, us, the waves of our society are hitting against us every single day, challenging us to compromise what we believe. Challenging us to walk away from the truth and distance, us, distance ourselves from the word of God. Let me explain. Number one, I want to talk about how we're living in a type of Babylon here for the next moment, here in America and around the world. But this is alarming because this is a statistic found here in America in the past month. Christians, number one, Christians are rejecting absolute truth. Absolute truth is the idea or the teaching, the belief that God is truth, that his word is truth, and that it is absolute. Here's what the statistic says. This is done by Cultural Research Center, CRC, at Arizona Christian University. It says, among the findings of churches, the survey discovered that a majority of evangelicals or Christians, 52% say there is no absolute moral truth that applies to everyone all the time. 52%. That'd be like taking half, our two services, split them in half, just over that, and that many people don't believe in God as the absolute truth. In other words, the other option is, well, it's true if it's true for you, but not for me. It's called relativity, or to be, not relativity, relativism, and it's to be, have relative moralism and to have relative convictions of whatever's conviction for you that's conviction for you, but not for me. This has crept into the church that 52% believe there's no such thing as absolute truth. The next statistic actually, harm, like, it concerns me even more, but it, it plays into the role of this statistic. Out of this same study, 43% said that Jesus sinned. If Jesus sinned, then he wasn't the sacrifice we needed to, he had to be the spotless, blameless lamb in order to be powerful enough to save all mankind from sin. So if Jesus sinned, then, then we are all doomed and we're going to hell. But it makes sense that that's the belief that would be there because if you reject the word of God as absolute truth, then you can begin to change what the word means and what it says. I just have one question for our world. Then what is truth? Because no one's figured that out yet then. And we're all doomed and lost. 2 Timothy 4, verse 3, and this is a warning to us as a church Back in the day, around 2,000 years ago, from Paul to his understudy and apprentice, Timothy, he says, for a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. And I want to tell you something, church. I'm not saying we're perfect I'm not saying that we have it all together, but I want to encourage you, if you're searching for a church or you're finding a place to make your home, whether it's here at Calvary or another church, will you do yourself a favor and make sure you listen to not only what they do teach, but what they're not teaching? <clears throat> what we tend to find is when you go to churches, you hear about this much of the Bible, and there's a whole lot more in that. Everyone wants the, gr the grace of God, but doesn't want the holiness of God. And it's scary. And I say this to warn us as parents, as disciple makers who should be teaching people the truth with a posture of love, right? Well, let me get into that. We live in a pluralistic society that says there are many truths or gods. Pluralistic mean many, many ways. Well, at Calvary, we're monotheistic. We're one God, only one God to worship. The secular world fears that if a group of people believe they are right, okay, if the, the secular world believes that if we as Christians have this haughty, arrogant view that we are right, that we will force it upon them, kind of like the, the Crusades, 
which was done wrong. And that is a sin in the church history that needs to be repented of, and it was, and it was wrong. But see, the, re the reason why Jesus said to love God and love others was to, to tell the truth in a posture of love, not force. I'm not going to drag my neighbors and friends in my community to believe in Jesus. That's forcing them. The love of God will compel your friends and family to follow Jesus. Now, sometimes you need to have arguments. Like we said last week, you don't win many in to the Lord through arguments. But I do believe you, win, you can win people through reasoning and conversations. That's why you won't see me arguing with people online because it just doesn't really work that well online. We're already kind of already planted in what we think and believe. And it's hard to, it's hard to like to read someone someone's love and compassion when you're on Facebook, isn't it? There's only so many emojis you can use. And then it just starts getting weird. Like, I'm not going to say Jesus loves you. Um, you know, here's the truth of God's word. And then heart eyes on the emoji, you know, <laughs> love, love emoji, you know. They need to hear my, my heart and my earnest compassion for them. And so that's why I've been talking about building bridges through conversations and in person because they're more, they're more um, beneficial and fruitful than online. So here's the thing. There are those who would say absolute truth is arrogant. I would say that's not true. I would say absolute truth is gracious. Why? Everyone knows you can't have equal, mutually exclusive truths. Someone has to be wrong or someone's lying. In other words, you can't have 10 absolute truths because which one do you follow? Everyone thinks that Christianity is the only one that believes that we, we claim absolute truth. No, no, no. Many religions claim absolute truth. And anytime you say there is no absolute truth, you just claimed absolute truth. Are you absolutely sure about that? Do you see the trap and the fallacy that we live in in our society? If, every, if, if I can decide what is true for me and you can decide what's true for you, then I guess what Hitler did was okay because he was convinced that that was good. There must be a line to walk. There must be boundaries. There must be a standard of truth that all mankind is supposed to live. Well, I think it's an act of grace that Jesus would say, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man shall see the Father except through me. That Jesus is the way to eternal life because Jesus is truth in a world full of lies claiming to be true. How would you know what is true unless you have the authentic, the absolute truth? Jesus laid down his life to tell you, I'm telling you the truth. He came to earth and this messed up earth to tell us that. He could have stayed up there with, with God. They could have restarted and started a perfect world if they wanted to, but they loved everyone who was perishing because of our sin. They loved us so much. God sent Jesus down to save us. That's an act of grace, not arrogance. Number two, the first one I was talking about was that Christians have rejected absolute truth, unfortunately. Not all of us, thank God. Number two, Christians are approving sin in the name of love. Daniel was facing a difficult circumstance. In order to trap him, they had to redefine, rewrite what is right or noble. Our society is doing that now. Let me redefine love from my perspective, not redefine or define love from God's perspective. That's what our society is doing right now. Let me explain. We believe as Christians that we are to love God and out of that love, we love our neighbor as ourself. We believe that God defines what love is. What the world is doing to you and I right now, and even to you who are not believers, I want you to be aware of this. The world is flipping that around and saying, you're supposed to love everyone like God said. Well, the definition of God's love is, is different than the world's definition of love. 
if God is love, like the word of God says, because I still believe the word of God is absolute truth, therefore God is love, then God's the only one that can say how to love and what love is. And if I'm going to love God, I can't be now uncommitted to him by saying something is okay when he says it's wrong. If I'm going to stay loyal and loving to my God, I must stay faithful even if it hurts someone's feelings. Now, this is the predicament we are in as Christians in our society. They tried to rewrite the law because they couldn't find any fault in Daniel. And they did rewrite the law. Right now, we have a world of scholars that are not true believers and followers of Christ who have studied the Greek and Hebrew meanings of Scripture to try to tell you to, here, here's what's happened. In a nutshell, our world has not been able to disprove the Bible. They have been unsuccessful. So now what they're doing is they're rewriting and reinterpreting what it actually means. They're trying to change the meaning of words in our Bible. Because if you can't disprove it, then what you can do is distort it. Does that remind you of Satan? Didn't Satan do that in the garden? Didn't he distort what God said to throw everyone off, the two people in there, in that garden? And now we have sin. Thanks, Satan. No thanks. Man. And guess what? Humanity must take responsibility for our decisions. And it's interesting that the same spirit of Satan in the garden is the same spirit in the story of Daniel because they were jealous. So let me distort and come up with a trap and get rid of this holy man that we can't find anything wrong with. So let me distort his character. Let me make him look evil. So what, here's the thing. Isaiah 5, 20. What does it say? Let me go back to that. I, I went over that. Isaiah 5, 20. Where am I? I got lost. Oh, I'm jumping ahead. That's why. It basically says this. Woe to you who call good evil and evil good. Light dark and dark light. Sweet bitter and bitter sweet. Isaiah 5.20. Yeah, we're living in that world. Where if you follow Christ, you're evil. But the Bible says that we are being faithful, not evil. Again, let me say this again. In the posture of love, we are faithful to Jesus and his word, right? I'm going to have the same. That's why I preached for five weeks about being loving bridges. So if, if you're going to critique my sermon today, make sure you watch the other five messages. Because it's in the posture of love that we tell the truth. God is love. And nowhere in scripture does God love by approving sin. He hated sin and what it did to humanity. That's why Jesus came. To save us from it, to free us from it, and so that we would go help other people be set free too. The definition of love is not to approve or agree with every decision or behavior in one's life. I, uh, I love my daughter, but if she's playing with matches and gasoline in my living room, I'm going to be uh, disproving of that behavior. If my son thinks that he should ride his bike blindfolded down Route 13, I'm going to go ahead and tell him, uh, no, let's not do that. I love you too much to let you do something absurd like that. The thing is, is the world wants us to approve decisions, but we as Christians, we don't even approve of those in our own life, right? Like in other words, we should be disgusted at our own sin that we would never be tempted to approve of someone else's sin. They need to know that. There's a reason why Daniel was a man of integrity. He wasn't for sin. He was holy. 
And as we are holy, the world should not expect us to approve of anything that's not holy. Because it's in the way we live and the way we believe and the way we act. So I would never, here's the thing, if I was an unchristian person, if I was, if I was a, a sinner that, was, that didn't care about God, didn't like Christians, I would never expect you as a Christian to condone everything I say because I want to respect you and your convictions. It's called tolerance. So I would tolerate you as a Christian. That's the, you see what I'm saying? So your family members should actually respect your friends should respect your convictions and not try to get you to believe and think and approve of everything they approve. What's happening is we're being intimidated and shamed online because we don't approve of every decision of people's lives. Do not fall for that. I don't care if you're the only person. And by the way, just be careful about getting in debates on Facebook because it's, it's futile. If you want to know how I really feel about you and how much I love you, let's hang out and have some coffee. If you want to know how I feel about what's going on in the world, let's hang out and have some coffee. But listen, if you're one person that's saying, well, God is good and, and you know, what he says is true and is right, and there's a hundred other people who don't, who cares? Who cares? I saw this recently online, and I did care in one way. I started praying for God's mercy on those hundred people who were celebrating someone's sin. And I was so concerned for them. My heart broke for them. And here's the thing. And I'm going to talk about this. I don't care if there's an election. I'm going to talk about this in the future here coming up. Next week's going to be a great service. I need a little break. The week after that, I need to tell you guys something because, you know, we want the world to change, but we don't want to do anything about it in churches. We, we must change, church. We must get activated. We must go out and love our neighbors and, and, and use these packets to be light in our communities. You're never going to witness to your neighbor if you can't at least hand them a candy bar. We're redeeming what's evil and making it good. Redeem, we're redeeming a day to do something good with it. That's what Jesus would do. Do you think Jesus would take the day off because it's Halloween? No. He didn't take the day off on the Sabbath. The religious elite, they didn't like that. He was like, hey, you got work to do. If your ox had fallen into the pit, wouldn't you get it out? That's what he told him. So he did. He would help people every day because every day belongs to the Lord. Every day belongs to God. I'm not letting this world rob me from witnessing and sharing the love of Jesus Christ. I'm not turning my lights off. I'm going to put a bunch of lights on. Wow, I'm getting into it, ain't I? So, here's the thing. You can love someone without condoning their sin. It's not easy, but you can do it. You can still serve them. You can show them kindness. You can feed them. You can be there for them. You can be that stable bridge so when things go really bad in their family, you can be like, hey, I'm here. Here's some food. You know, let me pray for you if, you, if you're okay with that. I heard a beautiful story this past weekend of someone taking years for someone to finally go, yeah, can you please pray for me? For years, they couldn't, they were, they were like, yeah, you can pray. Like, they would say, we're going to pray for you. And she's like, oh, okay. And then now she's asking for prayer. You can also love a neighbor without shaming them for their sin and putting them on blast to all the neighbors and all that other stuff and gossiping about them. I need to keep going. So thirdly, our world wants the blessings of God without his holy standards. This has been in my heart for a while and it's time to get it off my chest. Our world has shown their cards we look at our world right now surrounding COVID and injustice, and what you see is a world that actually does care about human life. We care about good morals, don't we? We care about the sanctity of life, don't we? Well, it depends on which one we care about. Pre-birth or after birth. 
it depends on which one we care about. Because if we leave that baby alone and let it happen, it will come out a human being. Because it is a human being. There's a reason why they're harvesting babies for organs, for humans, because they're humans. Our world has shown their cards. And by the way, we as Christians need to posture ourselves in such a way, if someone has had an abortion, we love them. We love them. We love them. I will never, ever shame someone for making that decision. I will pray for them, and I will be there for them, and I want to help them because they're going to grieve about it. So our world believes in the value of life, in justice, and in good morals. But our world doesn't want God, who is the author of all those things. Where does your intrinsic value come from that we should treat you with respect and dignity? Where does it come from? Two rocks that collided? No. A God who made you in his image and then died for you later so you could still be special. And where does compassion and love come from? From God who is love. That's where we get value and compassion for humanity right now. And guess what? It is awesome that we care about injustices. We should. As a church, we should care about injustice, all of it. And we should care about life and human life and respect people's life and make sure they stay alive, especially if they don't know Jesus. We should. There is nothing wrong with that. But we know as, a, as people who follow God that we get that value and we get compassion from God. So why are we kicking God out of our nation and out of our personal homes and lives? Why are we doing that? And, and church, I'm actually talking to us. I'm talking to us. Why isn't God in our homes more often? Why does that Netflix logo show up more than God? Why? We can't be mad at this world too much. We, we got to take responsibility for what we've done. The devil has, has unfortunately, his traps of... of his traps of, of, of being distracted in this world with all the things that we can enjoy. And yet this isn't even our world. Heaven is our world. God, help us. Help us have mercy. God, forgive us. That's why we keep hearing these words from God every week that God wants us to repent and, and to confess our sins and make him number one in our life again. And so me, all of us, we have to take responsibility for where we've messed up as a church. And I say that in love, right? The world is so confused. I don't want them judging me. I don't want the world to say whether I have value or not. They can't pick it out. They can't see it. I want God to judge me. We are in a mess because we have denied God's place in our personal lives and in our society. So let me finish with this. What's our response? How do we stay strong in the face of intense pressure to compromise? Number one, be loyal to the word of God. We're so quick to want the approval of man, but who's been faithful and true the whole time? God. The Bible has never failed us, but those who fail to follow it do. The Bible works if we actually apply it, in other words. And listen, I, I, I want you to, number two, I want you to recognize the world doesn't know where it's leading you. There is no clear destination. The options that you have outside of God, and I'm talking to you if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, tell me a good option. Show me a good option. Show me verified evidence. 
Show me promises that have come true. Show me a, a, some kind of literature that is not scrupulous. Show me something. Show me a path. I haven't seen it. I've been searching. I don't see it. And the way our world is so confused, they don't know where we're going either. We can't get along. So I'm not trusting man. I'm not trusting man to judge me either. I'm trusting God. His word has never failed. His, ne his word has never failed. So church, we need to know the truth of God's word and pass it down to the next generation. Young people, kids, teenagers, young adults, adults, know the Bible. Know the Bible. Look at the love of God in it. Look at his love that he would tell the truth. And remember, fourthly, that we are unwavering bridges that remain steady for those who choose to walk the bridges we have built to meet Jesus. What I'm saying is, is young people, adults, family and parents, you stay strong and someone's going to notice and they're going to come to you and go, who is this Jesus you serve? If we compromise, why would they come to us? We look just like the world confused and lost and not sure what true is, what, what is truth. If I begin to flip flop back and forth on what is true, I'm not credible. But if I stay faithful, someone who's lost, who goes, I'm done with this world. I want Jesus. They're going to come to you and they're going to walk that bridge and they're going to meet Jesus because you'll introduce them to Jesus. And again, a reminder, we too will overcome death at the resurrection of all the saints who remain faithful to God until the end. That's how we stay strong and unwavering in our world. We have a promise that we will be resurrected just like Daniel was pulled out of that pit, untouched, unscathed, unharmed. Amen. I'll be standing together. Wow. One of the best things we can do this week to show that we love God is to love him and be faithful and to, to love others. God has created every single human being in this world. I don't care what they look like, what they believe. I don't care what, they, what it is. They have value in God's eyes. Church, we must show God's love. And in time or when it's right, we tell the truth. And do not swerve from it because people are looking for something that is actually true and doesn't fall apart as false. God, wow, you unlocked today some amazing things from your word. Your spirit is in this room moving. Your spirit is online in our homes. God, convict us. We need conviction. God, a lot of us don't feel like we can do this, but we can with you. We can't picture ourselves being bridges in Babylon or in dark places, but God, you picture us there. You're already there. God, we follow you. We trust you. And Lord, we'll be faithful to your word. It has never been found to be wrong. We thank you. Help us, God, not to compromise. But may our love be unwa unwavering for you. And may our love for each other during this season we're in be unwavering for one another too. May we pick and choose our battles, the ones that matter to your kingdom. God, we thank you for your loving correction today. We thank you for your loving truth because you don't want anyone to perish but have everlasting life. If you're watching right now, you're in this room right now, God has been trying to say this entire sermon that he loves you. And he loves you so much, he came to set you free from that sin. That sin that you feel like you can't let go of, that sin that has identified you as your whole life, let him identify you. Would you give your life to him? He will change your heart and your mind and your attitude towards him and the things of this world. He will do it. If you accept him in right now, just tell him, I'm yours. I'm sorry. Forgive me of my sin. Make me a new person. I believe what Jesus did for me on the cross. I believe he rose again and I have new life. I'm a new creation. Would you say that? And would you tell someone, please, so they can help you 
follow Jesus. Tell another believer of Jesus Christ, another follower, so they can help you follow Jesus. God, we thank you. We thank you for the fruit that's going to come out of this message. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you, church. Have an amazing Sunday.